founding a startup, that's the exact mentality that I had. It's sort of, it is funny you say that because that thread does seem to be apparent as I'm explaining all of this stuff. It's like definitely that sink or swim. It's like I like being outside of the comfort zone to then understand whether I can do something or not. Hey everyone, today's episode is all about where a career in design can lead. It's a fantastic conversation with Nick Spiller. He's the co-founder of a product called Superfy Finance. He's had a fantastic career in product design. He was head of the design team at NatWest Bank. He's also worked in a lot of other financial products. He's designed tons of websites and apps. And today's is his journey, really showing you how we got into the industry, then how we moved up into managing design teams, scaling design teams, and then how and why he went on to co-found his own product, Superfy Finance. It's really interesting basically to learn from other people. You know, we might get some tips on their journeys. I asked him if he'd given his younger self any advice and also learning about startups and how they work and how if you want to, you could even start your own company. So I hope you enjoy today's episode as much as I did. Thank you very much for Nick for coming on and I hope you enjoy it. I had a bit of an unusual sort of start, I'd say, to getting into design, really. Um, I went to a, a, a sixth form school that put a lot of emphasis on the sort of traditional subjects sort of math, science, English. And I was definitely the sort of RT kid that sort of gravitated towards sitting in the art room all day, playing around with um, print technologies, so like and traditional print technologies, so like uh, lino cutting, um, that sort of stuff. And so I knew I wasn't going to go down the traditional sort of university route where I went to um, study maths at Cambridge, that type of route that the, the school almost like instilled in you. Um, and so instead, after uni, I went to study at an art college. And this was quite unusual um, given the sort of friendship circle that I had. And I realized quite quickly that I was looking for almost like that next evolution of what art could become in the sort of commercial world. And so I gravitated towards digital design and digital design for me at the time when I was, I was going through college was really sort of um, like, it was kind of like album art. It was digital artwork that you would put online. So it wasn't actually like how you might imagine digital design to be nowadays, which would be app design, website design. It was really just creating art digitally. And this really fascinated me. And I sort of thought, okay, how, what, what's going to be the next evolution of this? And so that was where I began to sort of see, okay, um, websites becoming a lot more commonplace for businesses. How can I begin to sort of jump on that trend? And so really getting into um, the design world for sort of um, commercial use was through that evolution of thought process and me thinking, okay, how can I actually turn this love of art into a career? So did you... Um... When you were in college doing doing art, were you, were you doing projects at the same time, like commercially? Were you, were you? How did you get start doing commercial projects and websites for people? Gotcha. So I started doing the commercial work while I was at university. So I was midway through my course, and at this point, I'd been sort of taught the technical skill set. So Adobe, Sketch, InVision, those sort of so that sort of software, and yeah. so I really sort of begun to think okay i've got a three-year course going here why can't i start to build up some freelance stuff in the background whilst i'm going through this course because yeah. it almost felt like i was sort of in a way wasting some time because i'm i'm studying the university course but i've got the skill set that i'm going to have when i come out of this course at the end of the three years and so i actually convinced the university to give me almost like a room um, that was it was kind of one of their like office buildings that they had where their their staff would work, and so I set that up while I was in my second year of uni as a little freelance studio, and I'd have clients come in. I talked to them predominantly. It was sort of branding design. It was sort of basic website design. So just for sort of local clients, like nothing complex at this stage. So like a local business just wanting a presence online or even like a Facebook page that type of stuff. But I sort of thought. Why, why couldn't I be doing this now as opposed to waiting until I'd officially got that sort of degree and that stamp of approval to say, okay, you, you, you're qualified type thing. And so that was really what I started to do whilst yeah. I was going through university. And that actually put me in quite a good position because I was offered a full-time job before I actually left uni. 
And so what I decided to do in my final year, was sort of midway through my third year, it was a three-year course, and I actually decided to leave university, still continue studying, but doing that in sort of evenings and weekends, whilst actually working a full-time job nine to five. Um, and so as a result, I moved out of the university sort of area, moved back to Kent, which is where I'm originally from, and started to gain that experience alongside the freelance stuff, alongside still studying, that put me in essentially after those three years <clears throat> i ended up having a lot of experience for somebody of of my um age in a way that's really i mean that's really to be honest we have quite a similar background because so i studied graphic design in university as well up in salford and uh while, while i was in university i also did or well, work experience at the time i used to go down and design magazines in london and i think that's good for people listening it's like if you're doing a course using those skills along like you did is actually really good. I, I do want to ask you though, how did you um, how did you get those clients? What what was your advice to people who have these skills? How did you first go about getting your first clients, and how how did it grow from there? It's always a controversial topic. I feel like getting your first freelance clients because a lot of people sort of instill in you, don't do any work for free. But I kind of took the di a different approach and thought, I'm going to get as much experience. I don't mind if people are paying me or not just to be able to build up that portfolio and um, because i think this was kind of led from the fact that i didn't want to leave university and only have university projects in my portfolio and so i thought how can i get as many live projects or real world projects as i can in that portfolio to demonstrate how i'm different from maybe a peer that was also on my course and so i would actually reach out to startups um because i knew that those guys probably didn't have much budget and they were probably a little bit more open to working with students um I wouldn't explicitly go in and say I was a student because I thought that might put some people off, uh, especially sort of small businesses because maybe they think that the, the quality wouldn't be up to par. Um, I would, <laughs> and usually I'd actually find a lot of clients through Gumtree, which is hey, yeah. a bit of an odd way to kind of find them. So I would I would scroll through Gumtree and I would find um, people that were looking for like a logo design or a basic website design or something like that. And I would just reach out to them and I would say, look, I'll do this for free or I'll do this for sort of 10, 15 pounds. It'll take me a day or so just to get, get a logo done or a, a very basic sort of website done. Uh, what do you think? And majority of the time they would come back and say, yeah, let's give it a go. Because you think there's minimal risk on their side saying, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll put either free, um, well, the potential of getting a free logo out of this if it works. If it doesn't work, then I've not really lost anything. Maybe a couple of email exchanges, 15, 10 minutes of my time. Um, and actually, this could save me going to a, a proper graphic designer or a proper, proper digital designer up to a couple of hundred pounds. And so that was really how I managed to get a lot of clients. Um, I also partnered up because I was still at university while I was getting my first few clients. And I partnered up with a sort of, uh, I think it was the student union that ran a little sort of design group. And they basically offered out their services to local clients as well. And so I managed to get in with those guys. And quite quickly, I sort of made, I had the mentality of never turning down a piece of work. And so yeah. that resulted in this graphic design almost syndicate offering me a lot of new clients. And so they were sourcing them. I was doing the design and then they were actually paying me for those ones. So that was almost like the next step up from the sort of free logos and stuff that I've been doing. So you've always been quite entrepreneurial, I guess, from the start. I mean, I mean, I really like your advice. I guess that's the beauty of local businesses as well, because there's there's always going to be someone in your town who who needs a digital service, whether that be a website or I don't know, online marketing or something on or a newsletter, for example. Uh, so I think that's really good advice to maybe reach out and and offer offer them something rather than ex expect to take all the time. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So. Yeah. I guess we can move on then. So, okay, so you're in university. You've had you've got your own little business set up. How did you then uh, evolve your career in in product design? Where did you go? Like, I guess from university, and you've got all, you've got all these clients. How did you progress then? So, I was offered a um, a full time position uh, out of the blue. Essentially, a recruiter rung me up one day. Well, so I was at university and basically said there was this local um, web design business in um in my hometown basically and they were looking for a junior uh, designer to come on board and it almost was one of those that sort of seemed too good to be true 
uh, moments where I knew, okay, that was the type of company I wanted to work for at the time. Um, this recruiter was ringing me randomly. Um, I'd begun to sort of build up enough experience through these freelance clients that I guess I was a bit more comfortable taking on a full-time position so that I almost knew that I was going to be able to do that job uh, as opposed to I needed to get a bit more experience under my belt before I was full comfortable. And the only sort of caveat to that was I had six months left of my university course. And so at that point, I sort of, I went down for the interview, I built up a portfolio and it was kind of a printed portfolio at the time, which looking back on it, considering it was a digital role for web design, probably wasn't the best uh, approach, but either way, I managed to get the job. Um, and I decided quite quickly that I was going to take it and I was going to make sure that I was able to make uh, my university studying still work so that I didn't want to drop out of university completely. I wanted to finish the course and still get the degree. Because it was in the final sort of six months of that university course, I knew that the demand of work and demand of sort of face time for that course was going to get lower and lower as we got closer to almost that sort of final case study work. And so I think it was it was quite an easy decision really for me to go, okay, I'm going to leave that environment and go and go and work a full-time job. Um, when I did start at the, uh, the development agency, it was quite an unusual experience because I'd been instilled throughout my university sort of life of almost like the best practice way to do things when it comes to taking on a brief, understanding what the customer wants, um, maybe sort of putting yourself in their shoes a little bit, uh, researching, um, before then diving into, let's say, wireframes and then actual designing. Now, this agency was a little bit more unorthodox, I'd say. It was quite an eye-opening experience for me to understand that you didn't need to go through that full process for clients to be happy on the on the receiving end of, of the outcome. And that took me a little bit of time to sort of really understand and sort of come to terms with because... In my view, you you needed to go through various levels of research before you could understand exactly what the, what the pain points the customer had um, around their website, what they wanted solving before you could deliver them the best solution. Whereas the agency that I joined was a little bit more of a sort of, let, let's get it in, let's get it done, let's get it out as quickly as possible. Because all of a sudden you had this additional layer that I hadn't even thought about, which was revenue. And that was something that was obviously very important to the company and the longer I took to design a website, the more that potentially impacted the number of clients that you could bring in, and then obviously the number of uh, the amount of revenue that they uh, made. And so that was quite an interesting point in my career, where it was, a, it was both a challenge and a learning, where I realized that there were other elements that you had to consider when doing a website, when going through that process, uh, rather than just the sort of ideal journey that you're sort of taught in theory. Yeah, so, so now you're learning about the actual world putting it into practice in, in a business environment and uh, and what it's like in the real world. I, I guess all courses are all uh, perfect projects, really. When you're doing university, it's like, ooh, present it as yeah. a case study. It's perfect. In reality, it's like, we need this. For me, it was like, we need this magazine designed tonight <laughs> or something like that. And you, then you yeah, got to exactly. you gotta do things like that. So that so that's so that, uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting hearing your story. So uh, as you go through and now you've, I guess you've, almost got a problem that you want to solve you want to deliver better i guess you want to solve problems for clients effectively rather than just surface level stuff you want to actually solve real problems uh how did that evolve w where did you take that then so you're working with this agency you, you, you understand this problem i think what made me realize that i needed to leave that agency was the fact that they weren't really solving that problem they were too focused on almost just sort of getting a client in delivering a almost sort of bulk standard website and then shipping it out for them and for majority of clients that seemed to work because they were local local clients their websites were not very complex um it was your sort of typical couple of page website where you have home page about us page blog page contact page that sort of thing and so really i i realized quite quickly that i'd I'd almost reached the level of knowledge that I was going to get from this business because I was, after about two or three months, I was basically just making sort of cookie cutter websites each time. And I sort of yeah. thought, how is this going to evolve into that next level of my understanding of how to build a, a really good website? 
the ones that you'd see on various websites that are winning all the awards and that type of thing. Because that was so much of a sort of far reach out from what I was delivering. And so I guess I kind of got a little bit bored with the sort of basicness of what I was creating there in terms of how standard some of those those designs were. Um, the sort of real complexities came when I started to look at building a responsive website as opposed to a normal um, style website because that yeah. was really coming in at that time. This was probably sort of uh, 2015 when responsive websites were really sort of getting a lot more marketing sort of focus where people that was their selling point that they would do a, do you a responsive website and so even just that little jump made me realize that actually designing for a much smaller screen size came with so many more complexities and that begun to interest me more so at the time i think it was an iphone 3 or iphone 4 which is probably about three and a half inches screen size Bear in mind the sort of larger phones now are sort of 6.1, 6.7 inches. Yeah, basically tablets. And so trying to design. <laughs> exactly. And so trying to design something for that absolutely tiny screen, like looking back, you sort of go, like, how do we even use those every day? Um, but that that in itself was a real sort of it, sort of focal point for me. And it became my sort it, it sort of turned my day to day into something a little bit more complex that I had to use a bit more brain power for. And so then that kind of got me thinking, how do I go that step further what's the next evolution of doing responsive websites and that was when i decided okay i need to be looking at uh, app design which is essentially a responsive website at the time but but a full flow of that designing something that's actually meaningful as opposed to just a, a website so did well did you um so 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 now you're interested in doing app design did you did you stay with the agency or did you go off and then do more of your own projects? At this point, I went off. Um, I had decided to make the move to London as opposed to uh, Kent, which is what I was working at the development agency. And I decided to try and find a business that was really going to challenge me. One that was going to give me a lot of sort of ownership of the, uh, of, of the journey that I could create for, for an app product and one that was going to be a very complex solution to create. And so for me, the obvious um, industry that jumped out was finance because you've got payment rails, you've got uh, KYC, so authentication of the customer, and you've got various other processes that you would have to design for that would be completely complex flows that were almost sort of a world apart from what I've been doing for sort of local website design. And so for me, the almost sort of checkbox was had to be a startup. Uh, I had to have enough ownership in the sort of realm of design that I was working for. They had to offer an app. Um, and ideally that would be for both iOS and Android, because then that would give me that breadth of experience as well. And it needed to be in the finance or insurance industry or something that was going to have complex journeys that I was going to have to design for. Oh, so, so you basically so, went into uh, this no, knowing, sorry, you went, you went into this knowing what you wanted. So you had a solid understanding of the role you were going to take. It wasn't something random. It was, it was, it was nicely approached. Pretty much. Yeah. So I knew what was going to excite me for the next, um, three or four years of a role, because what I didn't want at this point was to almost sort of hop between different companies that early on in my career. And I think by understanding exactly what I wanted from that initial sort of real meaty role that would give me enough sort of complexities, enough motivation to keep working there for a longer period of time where I could really hone my craft as opposed to going for somewhere for a year, moving for another six months, another year, that sort of thing. I guess I guess the only thing I want to add at this point is for people who are listening who are starting off their careers is um, something that you touched upon about local businesses versus big corporations or, or, st or startups doing complex things. So uh, local businesses very much the websites are very very simple like there's that that's why we have website builders like squarespace and all of these really good building platforms is because they're, they're not that complex they might be a restaurant and it might have a menu on there it might have some complexity but not too much and that's why i know you said you you cookie cutted it kind of for there's only so much you can do for local businesses and um i i guess this is why big companies hire specific designers because you, you cannot use those products you have to like you said, a bank, it's got a very specific flow for signing up users or signing onto account. This is where, I guess, the craft of product design 
comes into its own. Um, so I just wanted to add that there. But so, so what did you find when you had this brief? So I found a startup um, called Loot, which was a finance startup. It was pretty much a day day zero at this startup. I think the initial founders have been running for maybe sort of six months to come up with a concept and, and raise a little bit of investment based on an idea. But really, they were sort of beginning to think, okay, how can we build this founding team together with at, at this period to get us to actual sort of building the product? So it was very much an idea when I joined. And Loot was essentially a finance startup aimed at providing financial education to students at the very start of their financial life. So really um, targeting students that um, day one of university, they receive four and a half grand or five grand of student loans. And they have never had that amount of money before. And all of a sudden they've got to budget for the next um, quarter or the next term. And so that's kind of what we were trying to sort of solve. Like how do we stop, well, how do we give students enough financial education that they understand how to budget, how that money is going to last them, what they should be spending on, how they compare to their peers as well in terms of velocity of that spending. Um, and that really appealed to me because it was something that I'd obviously gone through literally just like two years prior. And so to be able to take some of those learnings that of a problem that I could relate to and, and tick all of the other sort of boxes that I wanted out of that next career move was really sort of interesting to me. Um, we ended up building an e-money account that was linked to a prepaid card. And we were very much at that sort of pivotal point, I think, of finance over the past sort of 10 years where Monzo, Starling, Revolut were really sort of in those in, in their infancy. So sort of, I think Monzo, when I signed up for those guys, I think I'm customer sort of 4,000 because... I was looking at the competitors at the time and they were very much in that sort of realm of, of what we were trying to build at Loot. Um, and so that really excited me to know that I was not just joining a business that I was passionate about, but also one that had a very clear trajectory that could almost sort of evolve an industry or support or help to evolve an industry. Thank you. Well, I like the way that it's actually solving a problem. So a lot of businesses, I guess a lot of startups don't even really know what the problem is until later on. Like, I, I, like, I, I wish it would have helped me. Otherwise, I wouldn't have spent 90% on VR. <laughs> so um, what I'd like to know about Loot is, uh, tell me how you got into leadership. Like, what was your journey from, I don't know if you were the first designer on the team. How how, how did it grow, Yeah, your, yeah. your experience there? Yeah, so so day one of Loot, I was pretty much brought in as a, as a standard product designer. And the team only consisted of um, an engineer, um, somebody doing marketing, the CEO, and product design. And so very quickly, I realized that I had a lot of responsibility and I had to design everything from day one. And so going from being an individual contributor to two and a half years later, where I really sort of begun to build out a design team was quite a tough process for me because... I was very hands-on. I wanted to get as much experience as possible in terms of doing things myself. And so it was quite hard for me to almost sort of evolve into that design leader role, not from a sort of managerial capacity, but more from a letting go of things and sharing the load type thing. Because I yeah. think if I'd gone into this role and I was like, I, I need to get as much experience as I can do in a short period of time to really sort of step up my career, hiring a number of designers to almost split that workload out felt like I was kind of cheating myself in the sense that I wasn't able to get the experience that they were then able to work on different projects. But I think after about three years of me pretty much doing everything myself, I realized that it was at that kind of pivotal breaking point where I was almost forced to have to hire other designers. And luckily I was able to uh, hire a number of uh, really, really skilled designers that I've actually continued to work with throughout my career, bringing them into various roles and, and providing them with various other work. Um, but that was that was kind of a wake up call to me to go, okay, you can split the workload out to and, and delegate to other designers that you feel comfortable sort of working with and that you know their skill set, and that doesn't necessarily detract from your um, career growth. So were there any particularly skills that you had to almost learn 
going into a managerial or a design leader type role? I think one thing that was, this is going to sound a bit odd, but weirdly, no. Um, I think for me, it, it was it was weirdly easy to step into that managerial role. I think I'd always had that sort of personality where I was sort of helping people get the best out of them as opposed to sort of telling them what to do. And so I think my design leadership style is very much sort of collaborative. And so that helped me transition from being that individual contributor to being that design leader. And I think one thing that was important for me in order to do that was not to sort of take that leap straight away. It was to almost sort of ease out the individual contributor stuff where I was still hands-on and just sort of focus on the managerial stuff. So there was a good sort of two years or so where I was doing both roles essentially, where I was leading the team, but also working in a scrum, supporting that scrum. So I almost had my sort of ear to the ground type thing. Um, and I think that warranted, that, that's, a, that's a trend that I've had throughout all of my, the roles that I've had, um, whether they've been leadership or not, I've always tried to stay hands-on. And I think that has helped me warrant uh, a lot of respect from the team because I've been able to, if they can't do something in terms of, um, let's say it was an animation or a prototyping thing, if they didn't understand how to do something, I could jump in and show them. And so I think that helped me sort of build that rapport with a lot of the designers that I've had within my team. I think that's the best way to be. Or, Or certainly when I think being a young designer, I always looked up to the art directors I had whenever I worked because it is... The design is very much a continue. I guess a learn by doing trade. There's no right or wrong way to do things. Well, no right or wrong way really to do things. It's, I guess you need to do a lot of design and then eventually you will get good at design. <laughs> but you need a lot of feedback along the way from good um, good seniors. So if I feel like that's a really nice way to approach that. But it, so so now you've, you've kind of transitioned into this leadership role. You've got some experience. I, I know your next step. Or can you, can you tell me about your next step into like... Mm-hmm. I guess larger financial organizations, more established. What what was that move like, and what made you do that? Yeah, so so my next role was uh, going into NatWest as their head of product design, and that felt like quite uh, was it was almost a role that was sort of just happened because Loot was um, trying to get bought, or NatWest was trying to buy Loot, or a division of NatWest was. And so that process was going, I think, about a year or so, where they were trying to come to terms, valuation, uh, technologies, how that would all mix. And um, eventually that didn't go through, but NatWest ended up offering roles to a lot of the core team members. And so that was how I transitioned over to that role. It wasn't necessarily a role that I'd maybe, maybe sought out myself directly after Luke, going from that sort of high-paced startup to potentially an unknown of a larger organization that was this massive high street bank. But actually it was quite a, I think it was what I needed at that point um, in terms of my career, because after going through loot for about four years, I realized that I was beginning to build up this sort of imposter syndrome. And it's quite common for designers to have this where you sort of think like you're not good enough or uh, you, you don't deserve to be in the position you are in. And I think that was what I, that was what plagued me throughout entire career at Loot where I joined this early stage startup and within two years I was supposedly sort of lead designer and head of design of a very small team and you're sort of left questioning whether you could actually do that role whether you are actually at that level at a large business and so by joining that West and coming in at that senior role it was almost sort of a lot of validation to be able to say okay I can actually do this role Regardless of where I've come from, I'm able to support this role in a sort of large organization at a very senior level. Um, and it gave me a lot of comfort, I think, and validation of um, my seniority as a leader at the time. Well, that's that's nice to hear because I, I, I certainly got imposter syndrome early on in my career because I, I, I basically went from university into Wired magazine and then Vogue magazine with, like created the iPad apps. So they were the first iPad apps in the UK. And I, I, I basically got that job because I was the only person who designed an app on the App Store, which I did for my university project. So I immediately felt imposter syndrome when I was designing a fashion yep. app for the world's biggest fashion magazine with, and I've been, been out of university for like three months. Um, but so I think that's comforting to know that other people do get that. And I guess the only way, like you said, to get over that is to is, is, is to do things in different companies. Almost. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, like from my experience, like a startup is so different to a big corporate, like a big company. The pace is different. Um, I, I think it's very good for people to experiment and see what they uh, see what they like because the lifestyle is different in startups compared to large companies. Um, so I, I think it's good for people to experiment and see what they like. But it, so, what, tell me about growing the team in that West. Like, what what type of things did you do there when you went over there? So that was actually the first kind of thing that I started to do. So I'd seen what had worked um, at a very sort of lean startup. And I realized that when I joined the NatWest team that actually there were a lot of processes or a lot of um, things that could be streamlined or optimized. And so one of those was, for example, was we had a number of different scrum teams working on different areas of the business. So you might have a team working solely on the, the onboarding. You might have a team solely working on payments or on um, budgeting features, for example, or payment features. And I realized quite quickly that the design team almost wasn't structured the same as some of the development teams. And so in your typical squad uh, or scrum team, you would have uh, a number of developers, you would have a, a PM, so a project manager, um, you would have a QA, you might have a product owner, and then traditionally you would expect to have a designer in that team. Now, because the design team was structured in a slightly different way before I came in, essentially we had design was kind of seen as almost this, this sort of agency entity within the company. And they would almost sort of draft in individual designers into a scrum team, depending on when they need them. And so what ended up happening was we had a UX designer that was specialist UX. We had a UI designer that was specialist UI. And those two designers would almost sort of go into each scrum team and spend a bit of time in each team, almost floating between all of them. Now, what this led to was uh, a lot of sort of um, like bottlenecks because uh, the PMs, the QA, the developers wanted to work at speed, but then they would only get almost sort of shared design resource, uh, resource across all of the other teams. And so what I quickly decided to do is take the uh, UX designers, UI designers that we had and upskill them into product designers so that essentially they'd be able to support the full suite within each team. And so I was able to do that over the course of about six months where uh, I sort of cherry picked which teams the designers would have to go into. So for example, um, the individual that was traditionally a UX designer might go more into the payments team because that's probably where there was going to be a lot more sort of uh, complexities to have to design for as opposed to the UI side of things. Um, on the flip side of that, the onboarding might have been more, the or the budgeting might have been more up the UI designers substreet. And so in that case, having a UI designer by trade that knew about uh, the sort of full product design suite of of, um, of tasks almost was, would, was fine for them to do. And so kind of what I wanted to do was set up these designers as T-shaped designers. So I wasn't going to have individual product designers that were exactly the same for each team. I was going to have a T-shaped designer that was able to support with a particular specialism, but also be able to support that full product design sort of journey. So they'd be able to do the research, they'd be able to do the sort of UX segments, the, the visual design, um, even sort of prototyping. But then each individual team member that I had would be able to um, support everyone else in the team for a certain specialism. And so one of those specialisms might have been animation or prototyping. And so even though everybody could do it, we would have one guy that was really, really good at it. And so if you had any sort of concerns or anything that you really wanted to make that was quite complex, you would then just have an hour or two of his time and he could explain and help you through understanding how to create that complex animation and that worked really well for us um it did mean that i had to hire a new uh, a couple of new individuals um because some people didn't quite want that that uh want to be turned into product designers as opposed to just visual designers which was fine um but it also allowed me to bring in some of the individuals that i've worked with at loops that i was very very comfortable with that i knew what they could do back into my team at NatWest. Can I just touch on something that you mentioned, which um, I know terminology confuses a lot of people. So, so when you say you upskilled um, 
I guess, designers into product designers. What What is your kind of concept of a product designer? And the second part of that is how did you upskill them to, to learn these other things? So my definition of a product designer is someone that's able to take a brief and carry it all the way through the process. So they would be able to um, conduct research to understand exactly what the need of the customer is, what the use case is, what the problems are, then put it into the sort of UX phase where they might uh, mock up wireframes. They might begin to sort of refine that customer journey to determine exactly what content needs to go in that journey. Then they would be able to support with the visual design, which would be traditional sort of UI designers, which would be kind of um, making it polished. So how you might see it in the traditional app when you open the screen, that's kind of what the UI designer would sort of work through. And then also work with the product managers to be able to write up the specification, hand over the specification, and if needed, create various prototypes or animations to go with that. That's kind of my understanding of what I wanted to get these guys to, whereas what they kind of were before um, were maybe just able to support with one segment of that journey as opposed to the full full breadth. So that's the that's more their specialism then, isn't it? That they then shared with the team. How did you how, how did you go back exactly. actually? Upskill, exactly. How did you upskill people? Did you uh, did you have workshops? Did you assign them team members to help them? Just how did you do that? Yeah, it, it was one of those things that sort of evolved over six months. So we started off almost sort of doing a sort of skills matrix and going, where are you up to right now with all of these areas? So you were traditionally a UI designer. What is your sort of um, research skill like? What is your wireframing like? What is your prototyping like? And that allowed me to almost curate a bit of a sort of book for each designer to understand what they needed in order to get to that sort of end level. Um, we ran lots of workshops. We would also do, I guess it's kind of the equivalent of, uh, when developers sort of pair up. And so what we would do sometimes is we would have two designers go into a scrum team for a, a sprint for a two week period to really sort of work on something together with the focus that the person that needed to upskill was going to almost get mentored by the individual about that feature. And so an example of that was uh, when we we're doing the uh, KYC process, which was the uh, know your customers, so this identity verification during the onboarding for NatWest. And I initially had a UI designer in that team, uh, UI designer by trade, this is kind of what they'd come from, their background. And all of a sudden we had this really sort of complex journey that they needed to be able to support. And so for that one, we drafted in one of the UX designers just to be able to support them for a two week spread to almost walk them through their thought process, walk them through exactly what they needed to do and work on things together almost in a sort of, uh, well, very collaborative manner. So that then by the end of that two week period, the UI designer could understand exactly the journey that, you, that the UX had gone through to understand what was needed, what output we needed to do. They'd worked on things together. So it definitely was a case of what most of knowledge transition and that really helped. And so there were a lot of sort of elements over the six month period of that happening. Yeah. Well, I think that's a great thing to do. I mean, one, I guess one of the problems before we move on that I see, or I can imagine happening, you know, with, with the remote working culture, although it's got loads of benefits for early stage designers, having a, having a mentor hands on one-to-one -one every day is, is very crucial. And it's something that companies, I guess, need to at least think about you you could do knowledge transfer via video but having the idea of that partnership working in person with someone is very very important or it certainly was in my career um i'm i'm, I'm careful about time now so i want to so so i think this sounds great what you've done in that west but then you moved to america how, how did how did that come about so I was actually made redundant from NatWest as a part of one of their restructures. And so I decided what would be the next sort of step up of my career. And that was really to work for a US company. Um, I'd heard throughout my career that there was uh, a very different shift in mindset working for US companies as opposed to sort of UK companies um, or local businesses. And I think that was what almost sort of led me to go, okay, what 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 is this next challenge? And so... I joined a business called Zappo uh, at quite a pivotal 
point for them because they just sold or were on the tail end of selling off a portion of their business, their institutional side of their business to Coinbase. Um, and they wanted to revitalize the sort of existing part that they were retaining. Um, Zappo, for anyone that doesn't know, it was essentially one of the first sort of real crypto exchanges, um, but focused on institutional crypto. So where the likes of the sort of billionaires of Silicon Valley would buy their Bitcoin, put their Bitcoin and store it in essentially sort of vaults in the Swiss Alps. Um, that was kind of the, the premise of Zappo. And they managed to, at one point, build up, I think, something like 5 or 10% of the amount of Bitcoin in circulation was in their vaults, held by all of these um, wealthy entrepreneurs. And... Because they'd sold off that portion of the business to Coinbase, they were now sort of thinking, okay, we've still got this technology. What do we do with it? And so what they brought me in to do essentially was to support them with launching a Bitcoin-backed bank. Um, but this wasn't your sort of typical crypto exchange. Uh, they were just relaunching. Essentially, it had a sort of social good purpose. And so what they wanted to do is launch a global bank account available to anyone in the world that would allow you to almost sort of act as like a safe haven for your life savings. So they would support you to uh, deposit US dollars, Bitcoin, various other country, uh, cu currencies, sorry, that you could store in this uh, account that was essentially based out of, depending on where you were located, either Hong Kong or Gibraltar or somewhere that had legislation that was slightly sort of outside of local governance. Um, and we attracted a lot of customers from countries like Zimbabwe, Argentina, Brazil, because the whole premise of the proposition was to um, protect your life savings from government seizures, from hyperinflation. And so this really sort of made me think, okay, and I'm working for this US company that is very, very demanding, but at the same time, there is this huge global mission that we're solving. And so that was really sort of insightful for me because I'd suddenly taken that step up from building a sort of local banking proposition to solving all of these problems globally that were huge that I hadn't experienced personally. And so that was a real sort of shift in my mindset to really sort of consider how product requirements would change based on countries or regions. And it was almost sort of something that I hadn't experienced before because all of a sudden you had customers from Argentina asking for money transfers in person where they would meet up, swap US dollars, which obviously isn't the uh, official currency there, um, and almost do it offline. But then you'd also have people in, um, let's say, uh, Brazil that wanted a slightly different feature. And so all of a sudden I was having to design this, this core product that had multiple different customers and different customer bases. And that was really interesting because I had to figure out, uh, so I was leading the design team um, at Zappo uh, and supporting the product strategy. And I really had to sort of figure out how everything worked into this product without making it balloon, without making it conflicting with all of these different features. Because you always wanted to have to surface the feature that was most relevant to someone in Argentina, but keep it sort of lower down or hide it for somebody that was maybe in Zimbabwe. So that was a real evolution of... Um, understanding how to design products on a global scale. Um, I think just coming back to your question that was around sort of what was it like working for a US business, um, it it was a real shift, I think, moving there. All of a sudden when I joined, I, I think it was sort of, it must have been sort of my first week, and I looked around the product team, and I was like, wow, the, these, these guys are all A-class players. There's nobody that's sort of like the weakest link type thing. Yeah. Everyone here is almost sort of a step above maybe what I'd worked with in the past. And so then again, that began to lead to a bit of imposter syndrome, where it's sort of like, oh, am I am I one of these guys? Or like, can I keep up type thing? Yeah, so it was a bit of a shit. So I guess I guess your career's kind of been like sink or swim, isn't it? You, you get thrown in and then I guess you've got to, you, you've just got to adapt you know, as you go along. Founding a startup, that's the exact mentality that I had. It's sort of, it is funny you say that because that thread does seem to be apparent as I'm explaining all of this stuff. It's like definitely that sink or swim. It's like I like being outside of the comfort zone to then understand whether I can do something or not. Yeah. I mean, even in university, it was like you, you, you got to design these real clients before you finished, which which I guess is, mm. 
It's always the same thread. But so what what actually made you want to go into creating a startup? How did that come about? Because you've worked in these big companies, you're a, a design manager. What, what shifted? Was that something you've always just had in you? I think it was almost always something that I'd had in me that I knew I was working towards, but maybe didn't explicitly sort of write down or sort of plan for. I think being involved in startups and being involved in businesses and being around entrepreneurs my whole career, it almost sort of made me realize that that was where I wanted to be. Um, I think joining Loot and being a sort of founding team member, but not being the sort of uh, the core founder, maybe almost sort of go through that startup journey by proxy because I was very close to that environment, um, understanding the highs and lows of that. And then similar at Zappo, where Zappo was founded by a serial entrepreneur called Wences. And this guy has sort of made a lot of money, made a lot of successful businesses that he's built and sold. And I think it was very interesting for me to be able to see the two sides of the sort of very early start of that journey. And then almost like the very end of that journey of some of them that had had multiple successes that outside looking in, you'd say, wow, this person's really successful. And I think because I'd been building businesses for both of these sides, for the people that were uh, serial entrepreneurs and for the sort of youngest sort of startup individuals, I sort of took a step back and sort of realized like, I, I've, I've got the skill sets. I've been building these businesses for other people for eight, nine, 10 years or so. What's to stop me from doing it for myself? And I'd seen the progression that some of these individuals that had started businesses, the trajectory that they'd been able to go through in terms of career and how much building a startup had escalated that and the knowledge that they had versus somebody maybe in a similar sort of role, but that hadn't. Um, so for example, a designer that had gone straight into corporate as opposed to a designer that had gone through the startup journey, seeing the difference in their skill set, their mindset, their knowledge, that was almost what sort of <clears throat> led me to think, okay, where could I be if I took this this leap? Well, I think that's a, that's a very good point. I think it makes you a better designer. So I, I know just from doing like my own YouTube channel or doing, I don't know, trying to do like an online course or something, you've got to learn every step of the process. You've got to learn where you get your customers from. So many other, you, yeah. You've got to learn what they yeah. want. You've got to learn how to market them. You've got to learn how to make a profit because you've got to spend money. <laughs> so... And you've got to you've got to, yep. you've got to learn an entire sales funnel, which is is very it, it makes you a better designer, I guess. So so tell me about like start. Uh, I guess it's Superfy. Tell me about how you got started yes. in that. So I got started in Superfy um, through well, the the sort of spark of the idea came from a bunch of research that I've been doing throughout my career on vulnerable customers, on customers that were maybe overlooked by the financial system, um, those that were in debt, those that were struggling, those that companies didn't typically want. And so, for example, if somebody is behind on their bills or already in arrears on their credit cards, typically sort of banks, lenders, even sort of wealth products don't really want them because there's no real value. They don't have high deposits that maybe some wealthier individuals would have. And so it really sort of made me step back and go like, wow, there's, there's this real sort of gap in the market of products that are designed for these people. And that was kind of where I got up to with uh, the research before I took the leap to found a company. And I just ended up going through an accelerator program because I knew that from um, reading things through YC articles and things like that, that now having a co-founder helped share that load and also helped you sort of statistically have more likelihood that you were going to be able to fundraise, that you were going to be able to make a success out of this business. And so I knew that I needed a founder. And I'd, I'd looked online through various forums, but trying to find a founder that was really committed was quite difficult, um, simply because life stage, some people wanted salary straight away, some people wanted um, to change the, the, the vision or had a slightly different outlook of what the business should be. And so trying to find somebody that was aligned was quite difficult in the early stages. So I decided to join an a, a incubator program called Antler. Now, this, this program basically took wannabe founders, shoved them in a room together for, I think it was about two months, 
And the result of that would be you would be able to find a co-founder that was in a similarly sort of willing position to commit the next five, 10 years of their life to building something. Um, and then the sort of benefit of that is that Antler would actually, if they thought that your business idea was was interesting enough, that was valid enough, uh, they would invest in you. And so they would give you that sort of, it, w- it wasn't a lot, but it was enough to kind of get you started on that journey. And so that's really sort of ticked a lot, a lot of boxes for me. I was able to find a co-founder. I was able to um, get investment and I was able to have some, be surrounded by individuals that would help challenge me and validate some of my ideas that I had around what a startup should be and what proposition I should build. So that was really the sort of early days of, of Superfy. So one of the things I want to know about Pandler is, so I know you, so I, I get the point, you, you you understand that this problem, you've gone to a, a start. These accelerators, um, for, I've, never, I've never been in one. So are they just unpaid? So you go there, you you work with a client, and then I guess you, you present at the end of the two months to Antler, and then you either get um, funded or not. Pretty much, yeah. So uh, there are a couple more steps to just that. Um, you apply for the cohort. So they run, I think at the time when I was going through, they ran about two or three cohorts a year. I think they've since increased that. Um, but essentially, you apply to a cohort. There's maybe sort of 60 to 80 individuals that are on that cohort with you. And all of those guys have been vetted by the Antler team to decide whether they might be suitable founders. And what that means is their motivations are right. Um, they've maybe got skill sets that would lend them to market uh, sort of industry trends that are coming up. Um, they wanted to have a mix of um, different skill sets. So designers, developers, marketeers, that sort of thing, maybe sales guys in that cohort. Then over the course of two months, they would essentially say to you, okay, come up with like mingle with everybody else, find people that you gravitate towards almost do a sort of skills analysis against one another to sort of understand where you might be, um, have, have, have a good match of skills and then come up with business ideas. And then over the course of those two months, you essentially sort of every week, I think it was, or every two weeks, you evolve your business idea. And each time you're pitching in a sort of mock um, investment committee type pitch, uh, getting feedback from the app team. So I think day one of Superfy, when we first came up with the concept, we were just going down. Um, I think we were a consolidation loan platform. And then that's eventually evolved. I don't even think we had a name at the time of the business. And that sort of evolved over those two months into something that was very investable at the end of it. And then after that period, you basically go to a sort of final investment committee and at that point, Antler uh, makes a decision whether they want to invest in you or not. So is it essentially a bit like Dragon's Den? How realistic is that at the end when you have to, do you have to present kind of like a, like a deck to a load of people standing there? Exactly. You, as you do it. Yep. So, th- I mean, I guess my question exactly is- that process. <laughs> yeah. So I guess Superfy exists. So did you get the funding and what, what, how, what were the next steps? Yeah, we got the funding. Um, the proposition has evolved in the sort of two years or so since then, um, but it's evolved in a sort of positive way. So uh, the the next steps after receiving that investment was to really sort of build the MVP out. So they invested at kind of an idea stage. So we had a little bit of traction where we built, I think it was an Excel spreadsheet just to get some market validation of what we were trying to build. Um, and we'd been speaking to loads of customers and we sort of, got a bunch of uh, kind of like pipeline for businesses that might want to buy this solution if a year down the line we built it. And so really the next step after Ander had invested was to um, really start building what we were telling people that we were going to build. And so the next step for us was I, I sat down, I did a bunch more research. I This is where having a product design background really kicked in and really sort of helped us. Uh, myself and Tom, my co-founder of Superfly, almost sort of escalate this journey because him and I have both worked in startups and so we knew the journey to go through to get an MVP live. We knew how to fulfill the research. We knew how to design the product. 
and we knew how to actually sort of put this product out there and Tom's background is sort of sales. And so he was able to really sort of help find those early customers. And so I think because I had a background in product design, it helped escalate that journey a lot quicker than if I didn't. And so a lot of the individuals that were also on that cohort that did also receive investment from Antler maybe sort of had to, in those early days, day one step for them was to find a designer, was to find a developer. And then they would need to write out the specification and almost hand over responsibility to those guys. But because I had that background, I was able to sort of do a lot of the stuff in-house and progress the company quite quickly in those early days. Yeah. So I guess each step of your career has kind of been, I guess, stepping back. So starting off in design, stepping back to product design, and then kind of bolting on, starting the actual company and selling the company at the end or, or, or taking the company forward at the end of it. Which, which is a nice progression for a designer. It shows you, you, you keep stepping back and you keep seeing more of the process of a business. Um, so, so when you had the MVP, what, what, what happened next? Mm-hmm. So at this point, we took it out to market. And like all good MVPs, majority of them flop. And so we realized that actually maybe we'd, we'd got things slightly wrong. And so we needed to evolve things. Um, there was also a lot of complexities that came with that MVP because it was dipping into an area of, I guess, finance that I hadn't really experienced before, which was regulation, which was partnerships, which was some of the things that you actually needed to get regulated for. And so one of those, uh, one of the elements that kind of not slowed us down, but was another sort of um, pivotal moment, um, we needed to get a certain level of regulation in order to release this feature. Uh, and the feature was essentially hooking into customers' open banking. Um, taking a step back, because I realized I haven't actually described what Superfy does, but essentially what what, what the company does, um, we support customers by, um, well, when I, we reward customers for paying their bills on time, and then we support them when they can't afford to pay their bill. And so we're slightly different to traditional sort of um, debt companies where we spot customers showing the early signs of financial distress as opposed to typically companies would only get or reach out to a customer after they have sort of missed a bill or fallen into arrears. If you think about like your utility provider, if you miss your council tax, um, for example, you're probably not going to hear anything in the lead up to you missing that bill. But as soon as you have missed that bill, that's when you're going to be getting through all of these notices in the post saying, or oh, you're overdue or you haven't paid. Now, what Superfy tries to do is rather than dipping into the collection side of things, which is the reactive after someone's missed a bill, we try and focus on the preventative measures. And so we hook into open banking. We understand whether a customer can afford a bill or not and what their likelihood is. And we almost sort of score that with the sort of traffic light system. So if we see that somebody isn't able to afford a bill, we'll reach out to them then as opposed to after they've missed that bill. Um, and so coming back to the original sort of question was um, one of the things that we needed to get done in order to uh, ensure that that MVP was a success was get regulated to allow us to hook into their open banking. And now we needed to hook into their open banking so that we could see their transactions so that we could then analyze those transactions to understand whether they could afford a bill or not. And I, I hadn't really had any exposure to the actual regulatory side of things. And so there were responsibilities that I had to take on during that MVP sort of journey where it was outside of design and it was very much, okay, now I need to write up all of this legislation to almost sort of understand how we can get regulated and how we can comply with the regulations and that type of stuff. And I think as a designer, it was a tough point because there was an element of, I knew what product needed to be in the market, but there were these hurdles that we needed to get uh, get over before we could put that product in the market. And these hurdles were things that I couldn't solve by jumping into Figma or I couldn't solve by just researching or, or using my traditional sort of product design skill set. And so that was quite an interesting time for me because a couple of months would go by and I wouldn't have done any product design or I wouldn't have been involved in any sort of product design. And so that took a bit of a mindset shift to go, actually, now you're a founder of this business there are going to be times when you're not just doing the nice stuff, which is the product design stuff. Yeah, so you're learning, I guess, again, real life skills. You're, you're 
you're finding out what, what actually needs to happen for the product. I guess it's kind of like learning development. So when you when you do when you design a Figma, you design the screens, but then you you need to understand how to get that product live on the real website with the hosting and then the package. Yeah. And, and I guess you're just yeah. you've got that, and now you're figuring out how to get that live in the marketplace with the regulation added on. Yep. So I, I presume that the regulation went in. How, I, I guess you can just talk about how you got that through, and then how you started acquiring acquiring customers. Yeah. So I had I was lucky enough to surround myself with a number of other founders that had previously gone through um, the regulatory permissions to get AIS and PIS. Um, one is to allow you to essentially initiate payments, and one is to allow you to look into a customer's uh, bank account to read their transaction and balance data. And so I was lucky enough to be able to rely on a number of other founders that I, I maybe wouldn't have interacted with as much if I wasn't a founder myself. Um, if I'd have just stayed in the product design bucket. Um, and that really helped. So almost being able to collaborate with individuals outside of my direct team really helped progress the company forward. And I think this was one of the first times I'd actually done that in my career, which was instead of going, okay, the, the resource of the company are just people employed by the company. They're the only ones that can help me solve this solution. This was really a case of going, Okay, well, I can I can look outside of just the business to understand who else could help, who else is willing to help, and who else can almost act as a sort of extension of knowledge as opposed to just employees, and that they, that was an interesting learning curve for me. Um, but that by by being able to reach out the, to these individuals that have been through this process of getting that regulation like six months prior, that helped speed up our journey massively, and as a result, that helped us get the product to market. Um, much, much faster and start sort of acquiring our first customers. Now, Superfy is a slightly different business model where instead of selling into direct consumers, we sell to businesses who then promote the product to their customers. And so really the sort of sales process of finding and acquiring customers was not um, putting money into the Google ads or putting money into Instagram ads or social media, that sort of thing. It was really trying to find partnerships um, through businesses that would then get value from this product to their customers. And so one of the things, so while I was building the MVP, essentially my co-founder Tom was working on that element of the business. And so he was going out and he was building partnerships with local London councils under the premise that as soon as we built the MVP, they would be willing to pilot it to their uh, residents that we could then get feedback. And so I think actually our first pilot went live with Newham Council and the premise there was we would we would provide Superfy to their residents if those residents um, essentially we would help um, Newham Council understand and spot customers before they fall into arrears essentially reducing their arrears rate. And so it's kind of got benefits on both sides. And so that was what Tom was working on while I was building the MVP. So I guess there's a lesson there. I guess two lessons I can think of. One is the value of your network, especially on things like LinkedIn. I don't know how you reached out to other founders, but I presume LinkedIn would be a tool where you could reach out to, I guess that's how we connect. Yep. And also having having a co-founder whose skills are different than, I guess, ours as designers, having someone who's more of a sales background. Um, I guess that's what I've taken from Definitely. that. Definitely, yeah. So uh, completely well, right. Yeah. And I... Go on. I was I was just going to say one thing. I've I've seen all, all yeah. your recent posts on LinkedIn that Superfy has actually gone on to do great things, and you've been um, recognised for some awards recently. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So I think one of the one of the biggest awards that really hit home for me was um, we were nominated for the in in the financial wellbeing category. Um, for 11FS. Now, 11FS, for those that don't know, is a very sort of well-renowned consultancy um, that operates in the finance space. Um, they run podcasts, they've got products, I think they've even got a banking platform, they're now building an investment arm. And so to be recognized by those guys as an upcoming uh, business to watch was, it, it probably meant more than some of the other uh, awards that we've been nominated for. Um, coupled with the fact that some of these awards that you're nominated for, um, you kind of get nominated for by buying a table. Um, 11FS wasn't like that. So it was very much like, um, 
we hadn't had any interaction with the company, somebody there and a number of other individuals in the industry had put us forward and nominated us. And so that was a nice surprise to actually see that we were being recognized um, in that space. Well, I guess what's nice about your story is kind of throughout, it's um, being thrown at the deep end, whether that was early on or, or, or now of a startup, and then it's feeling imposter syndrome and then being validated, whether that's through the company or whether that's through, I guess, um, through, through awards, which is fantastic. But what I'd like to, I guess, wrap this up with is, do you have any advice for people going on starting out this journey? If you could go back, what advice would you give to yourself when you were starting out? I think, so the first one that springs up is like, don't be afraid to reach out to people. Um, I think I've been able to make a lot of the opportunities that I have, I think for myself by reaching out to individuals, whether that's on LinkedIn, whether that's at networking events, um, and whether that's just, just via email. Uh, I think there's even a, a Steve Job quote that is like, most people never ask. And it's kind of under the premise that be that sort of 1% that do actually reach out, have a chat with people outside of your network, make your own opportunities, that type of thing. Because it's definitely something that I've done in the past, it's worked and I'll continue to do. Um, and then I think from a more sort of product design sort of realm, I think trying to stay on top of new technologies that are coming out and understanding how that could potentially evolve what is demanded of from a product designer so what i mean by that is five years ago it was really amazing if a product designer could animate a prototype or do animations but now because of the likes of webflow for example the no code tools that expectation of what a product designer is supposed to almost support with is increasing and so now rather than just designing a website a web a product designer is almost expected to be able to develop it in no code tool as well whether that's webflow or godaddy's sort of ai builder or squarespace or something like that and so i think just be conscious of um understanding what trends are upcoming to make sure that you're specializing in an area that you're comfortable with because if you if you don't want to go down that route then make sure that you pick a specialism that is just let's say um visual design and prototyping or animations as opposed to trying to bite off the full product design realm because it's increasing as the years go by okay well i guess one of the things i've got from this is uh try and make yourself as a designer t-shaped like you said before in that west it's kind of understand the process like you've done but also like take a step back understand the business and then mm -hmm. try and try and get experience in all the bits but but then have your specialty which makes you you yep. i guess yeah, yeah, so agreed. So to wrap things up, uh, I just thank you very much for joining me today, Nick. I, I think people will get a lot from your story, and uh, I wish you all the best with um, with everything that you're going to do coming up. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Anthony. Yeah, it's been fun.